The Rohingya are a group of people who have been outcast from their country. With nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, they seek refuge wherever they can. These are the people in need of help the most. Two friends set out to do just that. This is their story. In the DIA, the Wi-Fi is free, and you can charge up phones for free as well. It's the DIA. Door International Ip or he's smart. He's smart. How long? Six hours. Six hours waiting. In Doha. How many hours in the plane? Airport. Six hours flight. How many hours in the people? Four hours. No, three. Three hours. Two to four. And then you're no sleep before that. Being anxious. Trying to figure out how we're going to get to Tekna. No, we're not. Trying to figure out when our next video is. You can edit that out. But yeah, I mean, this is the first time we're actually pulling out the camera. We thought we could record a bit of something, something. Because he feels a bit strict about recording. 14 hours later, Khaled and Saeed arrive in Dhaka and were immediately greeted by the busy streets of Bangladesh. Um. No, it's 5.30 in the morning, it's 5.45 now. Um, we've got a long journey ahead of us. We've got an eight-hour train ride, I think, to Silet in Dhaka, which should be interesting. It was, uh, it's been a while for me on the train in Bangladesh, and Carl has not been on the train yet in Bangladesh. Lots of poor people walking down tracks, some living on the tracks. We're going to have an interesting time. Safety first. After a much needed rest at Brack Centre Inn, the two head off to the train station for an eight-hour ride to Sillet. The pair arrive on time at the station, where it was noisy and crowded. No, no, kids on the tracks. Begging is common practice in Bangladesh, with beggars often targeting foreigners on a daily basis. Having settled in the cabin, the eight-hour train ride begins. <laughs> Not long into the second day and tensions are already running high. The two argue whether or not to visit family as soon as they arrive. Carl and Saeed arrive and sell it, and after a day's rest it was time to purchase the blankets and prepare for distribution. Knowing how to barter is essential when dealing with market stores like these. Merchants often inflate the price three or fourfold when dealing with foreigners. With this in mind, Khaled seeks the assistance of his cousin, who's a native. The goal is to strike a balance between price and quality. Opting to lower the quality would yield more blankets, meaning more people could be reached. However, this will have a negative impact on the effectiveness of each blanket. Considering the large number of poor living on the streets, this would be less than ideal, while at the same time, too high quality would mean fewer poor would receive aid. With only a limited amount of donation money, this balance must be determined before they can proceed. We only get 260 of these. Of these? 80,000. We only get that many? Yeah, less, probably. Because I haven't even counted the dosh. You know what he changed today? Yes. Has he got the receipt? Give me the receipt. Give me the receipt of what he changed. Then I'll know what's going on. This 101. Say 101. 101. 1,000. Yeah, yeah. 
With the negotiations completed, it was time to arrange the logistics. It's not every day that orders of this calibre are made, so it is necessary to get third parties involved. We went around a few shops to check out the prices, and it was about 3.40, 3.30, and the standard rate was about 3.30, so he knocked it down to 3.20. My cousin over there, recording, my cousin recording. Yeah. 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 Uh, back to me, back to me. Boom, yeah, okay, he negotiated down to 305, so he, he kind of saved us a lot. And we're ordering about 300 units. And it's gonna get it's gonna get delivered and we're gonna have to swap. This is the first batch and this is the hopefully the batch that gets distributed in Sile. So we're gonna go on a night mission later today. With the deal set and the address confirmed, Khalid and Said return home and wait for delivery. <laughs> Eighty thousand. Yeah, ready count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, Ninety-five pounds of it was at one, two, five. Something went wrong. What? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Carlin decides to perform a final inspection of the goods. A stack of blankets is missing. The merchant assures them it's a mistake and offers to issue a replacement. The deal is now concluded and the merchant takes his leave, having more than exceeded his targets for the day. Unwise. Why is that? We go to here and we put ourselves in a situation that's highly unwise. We need to know what we're doing before we leave a journey into a we place. You can't plan too much, man. It's just going to put you No, it's not about planning too much. It's oh, about not listen. You're telling me you're going to go there without knowing where your shelter is? No, of course not. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's but we're going to stay. We're going to stay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. We're going to need a place to put it. Exactly. Well, we can't take it in a hotel and all that stuff. We ain't got a place other than a hotel. Oh, man, this is proper. Look, if we can get ground floor in a hotel, we're sorted. No, the, no hotel's gonna do that. What? Well, open the door so we can take some shopping in? That much, blankets. It's not like we're dealing drugs. It's just blankets. Go on, hear it out, bro, and you see what happens. You're I'm being a bit cocky now. Huh? You're being a bit cocky. You have to calm down and think about this. That's what I'm saying. You're over. You're over no, no, I, I'm trying to work out the logistics of it. Which is With what? You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything. I mean, if if it was not too much, the Rohingya are there, so there will be no point of us going. The Rohingya are there. The Rohingya are there. The Rohingya are there. Everyone we have to send is in Box Bazaar Chitro. What do you mean? Not everyone. Even that, what about that guy he asked from Chitro? Yeah, this is what I've done from. No, listen. We have donations. The argument continues for some time with no resolve. Eventually, the team decide to retire for the night and distribute the following day, when sensors are less heated. Balance is a fact of life. Being excessive in any one area can have negative connotations. Even with something seemingly trivial as drinking too much water. Since we are alone in this world, we wouldn't have survived this long if compromises weren't made and would not have prospered if middle grounds weren't found. The problem at hand is figuring out if you're planning too much or not enough. But sometimes in life, you just have to take a break. For this too is balance. Hello. Hey. Hey. Saeed begins flagging potential recipients. Night falls and distribution begins. The team soon learned that not everyone is going to be so forthcoming. They decide to hit the villages that Saeed flagged earlier on. Hey, 
As some of the villagers are concerned about uneven distribution, the team try their best to minimize this. Word soon spreads and the entire village converge upon the group. Saeed attempts to disperse them all, but to no avail. With too many villagers and not enough blankets, it soon became clear there was nothing they could do. They had no choice but to withdraw from the immediate area. Bloody hell, man. Night time. You see what happened? Yeah, no, no, no. I was expecting it. I was just waiting for it to happen. Because you know when those, when those two two came, yeah? yeah. It, it, that's it. Attention started spurring. No, no, that was that bullshit, guy, man. That's where that pissed me off. That why did guy. why did we go to one place, yeah? Stop and turn back and go to another place. Just finish that line. Oh, that's stupid. Now, now we can't keep track of where we were. The preliminaries did not end well, but the team decided to take this in their stride and persevere. They hit a known hotspot for the homeless. In contrast to the villages, it's much less likely for crowds to amass. Most people are either asleep or remain apprehensive to approach a group of strangers. Under these conditions, it was time to get some real work done. The team call it a day and take some well-deserved rest. The night has been redeemed. Currently in Bangladesh, 42% of the population live under the poverty line. That's more than 63 million people, equivalent to the entire population of the UK. When facing statistics like these, it's easy to get sidetracked. We must not forget the primary objective of this operation, the Rohingya. The team received word that their camps are located in the Chittagong district. For this, they must embark on a car ride that will last a total of 16 hours. What the heck? It's 4 o'clock in the morning. The 16 hour ride has taken its toll. They arrive at the hotel famished and exhausted. Any work will have to wait until the morning, which is only a few hours away. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So his name is uh, Mr. Uh, Salauddin, Muhammad Salauddin. Salauddin. Yeah. Salauddin. Yeah. I think he's going to help you out. Okay. Uh, that will be, yeah. be very good. Just very... next to him. Yeah. Okay. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, otherwise known as the UNHCR, specializes in helping refugees with local integration and resettlement. The Rohingya are an ethnic minority that originates from Burma. However, the Burmese government do not consider them citizens and have stripped them of the basic human rights. They are not allowed to travel without official permission. They are banned from owning land. They have been forced to sign a commitment to not have more than two children. What followed could only be described with one word. Exodus. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fled to the neighboring countries. Pakistan, Malaysia, Thailand. But the highest concentration is found in Bangladesh. Refugee camps exist in Chittagong district. These are controlled by the UNHCR. We rejoin the team in the UNHCR headquarters, Cox Bazaar. I mean, we, we understand there might be issues, so we thought if it's okay, even if we give it to someone. First of all, you have to collect permission yeah. from mm -hmm. our ministry. Ministry. ministry of Disaster Management, really. 
Okay. Distributing blankets to the refugees is proving more difficult than initially predicted. The location of the camps is considered a controlled zone. Travel is restricted. Only those who have been registered with the UN are able to enter and deliver humanitarian aid. Khalid immediately requests to be registered. However, it's not so simple. Khalid and Saeed are considered foreigners and are subject to security checks. Even a Bangladesh native would need to be screened, although the process would be significantly faster. How long are you? We're leaving, we're leaving on the 15th. On the 15th. 15th? Yeah. January. You are leaving January. Yeah. Khalid and Saeed have many blankets with additional funds to purchase more. But it appears the UN asked for the one thing they don't have. Time. They are due to leave Cox Bazaar tomorrow, rendering any hopes of registration futile. Khalid makes attempts to coerce the opposition by stating that the footage of the camps alone would induce public interest in the cause, directly resulting in more donations. But for this to happen, they must first be granted entry into the controlled zone. There are 2,969 families. The UN acknowledges this, but submits their own counterpoint. 200 blankets is an insignificant amount compared to the approximately 3,000 families that currently have registered, with many still in the waiting line. Furthermore, to distribute only 200 blankets would likely incite accusations of uneven distribution, a notion that Khalid and Saeed are all too familiar with. I'm a small fish. <laughs> Khalid has no choice but to back down, which goes to show Incentives which appeal to the heart are often ineffective when up against bureaucracy. The remaining two options are to leave the blankets of the UN and have them deal with it accordingly, or attempt to distribute to the thousands of unregistered refugees not in camps dispersed around the country. But ascertaining the whereabouts of these people would not be easy. Negotiations over. The verdict leaves a lot to be desired. Morale was low. A change of scenery was in order. The team visit Cox Bazaar Beach, one of the longest unbroken beaches in the world. But no matter where you are, you can't escape your thoughts. The liaison of the UN left questions on everyone's minds. With only two paths to choose from, the answer is a mere coin toss away. Saeed is cautious. He thinks the idea of a manhunt is ill-advised. Khalid instinctively approaches situations head first. He is not convinced and wishes to locate the unregistered refugees. It turns out the team is in luck. Khalid discovers there may be Rohingya nearby after talking to some children selling refreshments. After some searching, they were lucky enough to come across a member of the Rohingya. The man is apprehensive at first, but later reveals he is working under the guise of a false identity. Saeed takes note of his address, and once again, under the cover of darkness, their work begins. With the address at hand, the team soon find many Rohingya hiding out in a secret location. Due to the nature of persecution, the people in question didn't hang around for long, so our footage of them is limited. But for the first time since the dawn of the Odyssey, Khalid and Saeed finally reached the ones they were searching for. During the course of the next few days, Khalid and Saeed go on to help a lot more people. Each night, the distribution continues, with many of the homeless receiving blankets they so desperately need. It may be no substitution for a home, but it will help them sleep just a little better for nights to come. They also donate 200 blankets to the Bangladesh Female Academy, helping to inspire the hearts of countless children who are left without parents. The quarries are home to hazardous working environments. Women and children are often forced to work strenuous hours of manual labour. The team made sure these people were greeted with warm blankets after a hard day's work. It's not always possible to help everyone. It's at times like these that you feel truly powerless. Every journey has a share of hardships, good times and the bad. Two friends from London ventured to help a group of people who had lost their home. Though the outcome is not what they expected, more than a thousand people receive aid when they needed it the most. The actions of just two people are reflected in the faces of more than a thousand, reminding us that, although the situation seems dire, hope is just around the corner.